Good evening, everyone. Sorry it's a little warm in here. We did crank up the air conditioning, uh, but uh, clearly not, not, not soon enough. You know, um, um, it's, so, it's so amazing seeing such a, a large audience here, and um, uh, you all clearly appreciate uh, how special it is to have uh, Maggie Haberman with us this evening. I, I'm Brad Graham, by the way. I'm a co-owner of the bookstore, along with, with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. Um, um, you know, among all the journalists who've, who've co covered Donald Trump over the years, Maggie has done so uh, most extensively and um, now has produced a definitive book about Trump's life and presidency, A Confidence Man, The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America. A native New Yorker, Maggie got her start in political reporting with New York's two famed tabloids, the Daily News and The Post then moved to Politico for a few years before landing at the New York Times in 2015 as a campaign correspondent. Uh, during Trump's presidency, she was credited with, with countless scoops, uh, and her book is filled with lots of, of fresh revelations. But as Joe Klein wrote in, in a review in, in the Times, uh, more than the news nuggets, Confidence Man is notable for the quality of its observations about Trump's character and, and will undoubtedly serve as a primary source about the most vexing president in American history. And yes, uh, there's been um, uh, lots of previous, uh, believe me, uh, we in the book business are very grateful about that. <laughs> um, but but Maggie's, is, Maggie's is the whole package. Uh, it joins the story of how Trump came to be before he assumed the presidency with how he operated as president. It examines the influences that shaped Trump's personality and character, and then how those traits defined his presidency. Uh, in the prologue, Maggie recalls how after uh, covering Trump during the 2016 campaign, she received a note from a colleague um, when Trump won saying, this is great for you, she was told. She, she was quite surprised, actually, if you can believe it, to see all of you here gathered for her. Um, but, you know, uh, her, her tough, uh, outstanding coverage also has made her a target of uh, Trump's attacks and, and other uh, uh, even uglier stuff. Uh, so please understand why this evening um, we won't be having a, a signing line at the end. Uh, Maggie has pre-signed a, a lot of uh, other c copies uh, for anybody who's who's interested uh, afterwards uh, uh, up at the um, checkout desk. Uh, Maggie doesn't do many in-person appearances, uh, which makes us appreciate all the more her presence here this evening. We're also grateful to have CNN's Caitlin Collins moderating the event. Uh, as White House correspondent for the network, she's had her own many experiences covering Trump. Uh, and as a sign of uh, her rising star in broadcasting, it was announced earlier this month that she'll soon be co-anchoring a revamped CNN morning show. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Maggie Haberman and Caitlin Collins. kidding about it being a packed house. Wow. Thank you all for coming. You know this is a bookstore on a Friday night, right? <laughs> I'm like really impressed right now. Um, and with these audience questions that I've been reading through as well. Um, thank you all for being here so much. Obviously this is really special for me personally because um, I started covering the White House when Trump took office. Any White House reporter of that time will tell you point blank Maggie is hands down the best White House reporter, the best Trump reporter of that era. And that is not an easy feat in a time when it was all consuming of your life, of Twitter, of everything. And so it's an honor for me to be here moderating this event, reading this book and getting to ask you about it. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, really, thank you all for coming. I feel a little like I'm at my own funeral, but I'm very grateful <laughs> to see you all here uh, for it. Um, well, it's gonna be a packed up. So, um, there have been a lot of Trump books, obviously, during the Trump years, a lot of scoops, a lot of stories, a lot of things that you read and you're like, can this really be true? Yours, those talked about what he did while he was in office and as a candidate. Yours talked about why he did it. What made you take that approach? 
So I, th- I tried to look at both, honestly. I tried to look at how the why he did it informed the what he did. And I, I took that approach for a couple of reasons. One is, to your point, there's a lot of Trump books out there. They've, they've been filled with scoops. They have been things that have left me kicking myself. I wished I had had them. Um, you know, they, they informed a lot about that time in office. And he is one of the most written about people on the planet. Um, the, the perspective that I could offer is somebody who came from the same place he did, saw a lot of the same forces in a city that was really mired in dysfunction and corruption, touching almost every aspect of the life, the life that he was involved with uh, while he came up. And, and I had covered him and been around him prior to the fact that he was, uh, to him becoming a candidate in 2015. Yeah. Um, and I think that pages of this book. One of the audience question was um, that I loved was when you were writing the book, and this is from a student, so thank you for submitting it. When you were writing the book, what was your initial goal, initial message, and, and did it change at all as you were writing it, or did as you write it, it kind of only confirmed what you had sus- suspected? That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, it 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 confirmed what I suspected. I think it's just the degree to which the patterns were so visibly there uh, a long, long, long ago. Uh, you know, not just the pattern of, say, you know, not paying people and, you know, stiffing contractors and uh, trying to get media attention, but the pitting, this was the thing that actually I would say did surprise me. The first time I interviewed somebody who uh, told me that he asked them in the 1990s, you know, what do you think of blah, blah, this other person who worked for him? Because as we know, this was something he did with his aides throughout his time in the White House. And just the fact that literally every behavior pattern existed for decades, just unchanged and and sort of frozen in. Yeah, that really struck out to me. All of these themes of his life in New York that he brought to the presidency from his childhood, from his early years in the family business, his obsession with loyalty, feuding with Jerry Nadler, who later impeached him, warning people not to take notes in their meetings. You write that a junior attorney was just taking notes in a meeting and someone came around and crumpled up the notes. He, he came himself. around, yeah. He came around and picked up the notes over the guy's shoulder. It, it really was amazing. And then you, you write that when he was damaged in the press by his bankruptcies, by his divorces, he the one thing he could not get that he valued on a cellular level was laudatory media coverage. I have never encountered somebody who experiences media coverage the way he does. And I I think you would agree with that as somebody who's covered him for a while now. Uh, The the stories that would repulse other people about themselves, he revels in. And so I I write about one instance, um, you know, and this was was an infamous story. I worked at the New York Post for a combined 10 years. uh, And and that's part of the the milieu that formed him uh, was his desire to get coverage there and his sort of transactional relationship with the paper. I'm sorry it's so hot, <laughs> I apologize. Um, but uh, I, he, there was this one story that's a famous front page, which was you know when he was having an affair with Marla Maples and he was with Ivana Trump, and it, the headline was best sex I ever had. Um, she didn't actually say it, it was, it was basically a confection by uh, a guy who used to sit literally directly across from me. Um, and it was, a, it was a famous story in the newsroom that he was talking to a friend of hers and, and said, you know, I, I, I bet it, the sex is good too, right? And the friend said, yeah, best <laughs> sex she's ever had, I guess, right? I guess that became best <laughs> sex I ever had. And, you know, Marla Maples was said to really not like that headline, Trump. I wonder lo- why. Yes. Um, <laughs> which is a, an understandable reaction. Trump loved it because it was sort of proof of his strength and virility. And so uh, he just experiences coverage in a, in a different way because it's all attention and he seeks out getting attention. And I remember talking to people in the first year in the White House that they couldn't really get over the degree to which even as a sitting president, he tried to construct media opportunities day by day by day. Well, and can I just point out, I wasn't going to get to this till later, but a part of the book that I was just like, okay, which is you know kind of rare to do. You said that whenever he was in the hospital with Marla Maples after his daughter <laughs> Tiffany was born, that a tabloid reporter, had be, photographer had been invited in. They wanted to get a picture of the newborn baby, but because the baby was a newborn baby that he ended up taking a pile of blankets and posing with it, there was no baby. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> so this was uh, Linda Stasi, who's another former colleague, um, and, and she covered television forever. Uh, she was at both the Post and the News, and she's another one of these tabloid figures who, you know, knew Trump, interacted with him over and over again. 
Um, Marla has the baby in Florida, and this is actually sort of a revealing anecdote about him in a different way too. She she calls, she's pressured by her editor, you have to get a, a, a picture of the baby. And Trump says no at first actually, like no, that's not gonna work. And she says, but I'm gonna get fired. And he says, all right, fine. Because there is this kind of people pleasing thing and he doesn't wanna totally offend a reporter. So she comes down, she goes to the hospital, and she comes into the room, and Marla Maple says to Trump, what is she doing here? And Linda says, I came to see the baby. And, you know, can we get a picture? And Marla says, no, <laughs> and leave. And so they go into the hallway, and there's a stack of, you know, in the hospitals, they have those stacks with receiving blankets, and he takes a bunch of them, and he crafts a fake baby. And he says, you know, he invites her to take a picture, and he says, no one will ever know. And she, the picture was taken, they didn't use it, and I think it's, it doesn't exist in the Daily News archives anymore. Um, but that was, a, that was a story that I was a little surprised by when I learned about it, yeah. I, I truly was kind of, I, I was like taking notes for this, and I was like, I cannot believe what I'm writing down. But speaking of that, this is another great question that I loved. Um, is it hard to refrain from psychoanalyzing Trump while reporting on Trump? Um, it is not hard. Um, the, uh, <laughs> we, we get pushed to a lot, and I actually have tried to resist that. I think there's a difference between analyzing why he does something versus putting him on the couch, right? I mean, I think there's plenty, a, and there's a long history of analyzing presidents this way. Bill Clinton was analyzed this way forever. Yeah. You know, Obama's emotional state was examined forever. You know, HW's uh, was, W's was. Um, it's different with Trump because the behaviors just are so not within a normal frame um, of, of anyone who's lived in Washington and anyone who's been around presidents, um, that there is that desire to do that. I don't find it hard to avoid it because that's not my job. Two things in the book stood out to me also when it comes to a lot of the book, which which I found so interesting, was that it, it talks about what fueled his rise and where how we got where we are. And I think that's such an important thing to reflect on, especially ahead of the next election. You talk about the press coverage he got in the 80s and the 90s and how people just kind of let him lie and move on. You said, quote, some reporters acknowledged privately over time that they knew Trump lied a lot. And yet for years, many of his statements ran unchecked in print and on television because the impulse for reporters to give a subject the benefit of the doubt and the difficulty in disproving some of his claims gave way to so many how does he do it folks kind of stories and that in part helped shape his public perception for voters absolutely i mean i, I think we we have all heard lots of criticism of the media in the last seven years um some of it absolutely valid i think some of it less so but a lot of the criticism focused on 2015 and 2016 and the the presidential campaign and i know that there you know has been all kinds of complaints about the coverage of the rallies, you know, on cable. I would make the argument that actually the un the uncut version of Donald Trump, like you're actually doing voters a service because they can see the full thing and they can decide what they want. Um, news process has actually often benefited him, especially in newspapers, because the way we write stories is we we take a quote. We don't take the you know the eight graphs where he's saying contradictory things back and forth and so forth. And he and to that end. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, he brick by brick, news story by news story, built this artifice of this mega tycoon, uh, you know, uh, commensurate on a level with you know major figures of the day, when he just wasn't. And you know, people either uh, wanted him because they thought he was a good quote, or because they just accepted it and there was no way to to prove it. But he got the benefit of the doubt over and over. You know, I I write about how he exists in these brief increments of time. But so does the daily news cycle, and, and, and that kind of fed off each other. And what about how the beginning of The Apprentice also benefited that? You, you write about how you talk to a voter, and you kind of thought you were just saying, like, you know, are you here for the show to see Trump, see a Trump rally, see what it's like? And they completely serious said no, they, that they were going to actually vote for him in the caucus because he was a successful businessman. But you write, and I found this fascinating, that when he was beginning The Apprentice, Producers went to his to his par properties, and they they thought they weren't up to par for a television set. They actually kind of fixed them up, so people's mentality of him as this savvy businessman with these amazing properties was actually constructed by a, a, a camera crew. There is so much illusionary around him, and Mark Burnett, who 
uh, created The Apprentice was was a, a, an Art of the Deal super fan. And The Art of the Deal was His the book, book, Trump's book in 1987, which, he, which was ghostwritten by an author named Tony Schwartz, who has been a very vocal critic of Trump over the last uh, six years, uh, and who has said that he really regrets uh, being a part of it. But, you know, that book, and I just as an, a quick aside, you know, that book was very much written by Tony, and it contained the line, uh, you know, that Trump uses, quote unquote, truthful hyperbole. That's, that's not what he uses. That's, I mean, he just says things that aren't true. Um, but a book that was much more authentically Trump, for those of you who just want to get a sense of the difference between the myth-making and the non-myth-making, and I write about this, is a book that Trump wrote called Surviving at the Top. And this was uh, after he had gone through his, his, you know, personal problems, his financial problems. And it's, it's so bitter. I mean, you know, he, he, he talks about, uh, you know, uh, Malcolm Forbes, who had just passed away and who was a closeted gay man, uh, and how repulsed he was that people in the media were, quote unquote, covering for him. I mean, it was really, the, the change in tone from these books was the clearest sort of reminder that actually someone else is writing this. And it was a precursor to what we saw in the White House with, here's teleprompter Trump, here's Twitter Trump, right? Which, guess which one was more real? So when we get to The Apprentice, Mark Burnett, who was a super fan of the book, creates a character of Donald Trump basically based on this book. And they use his properties and they discovered what, you know, one of the, one of the people involved in the show described as, you know, a, a sagging empire. You know, the casinos looked kind of run down. Um, they had seen better days. The, the boardroom and the actual Trump Tower, it was, it's a conference room, wasn't quite right, so they built a set. But people saw that and they believed it was real. And I was not an apprentice watcher, so this was a phenomenon I didn't understand until I went to Iowa and I was asking a very leading question of people at this rally in Dubuque, which was basically, are you, are you here because this, is, this show is going to leave town soon? Because everybody, you know, the, the polls at that point showed, I think, Ted Cruz uh, ahead, Trump had been struggling, um, or Ben Carson was ahead. And folks, one after the other, said that they were going to caucus for him, including one guy who looked at me like I had eight hits when I asked the question. And he said I watched him run his business, and he meant this television show. They obviously love Trump. If you go to a Trump rally and you stand in line for hours, it's, I've been to ones where it's snowing, raining, the weather's terrible, it's late on a school night. A great question that I loved that someone asked, how does Trump actually feel about his supporters? Um, that's an excellent question that, um, <laughs> that comes up in the book. Um, you know, Trump requires a, a constant stream of praise and adulation from people around him, and so, he likes that part of his supporters. He definitely sees a market with the supporters. This is a guy who's been branding himself since the 1980s. He refers to himself in the third person um, frequently. Um, but he also can be very disparaging about his customers and his supporters. And I, I write about this in the book that he, you know, uh, was he was coming down an escalator at one of the casinos and said to a, a consultant who worked for him, look at those losers. Um, you know, he, he would talk about his supporters, you know, energy for him that once he was in office and he would say to White House aides, they're effing crazy. I mean, you know, he's, um, one of the things that he did uh, after the January 6th riot was he was dismissive to some aides about how, uh, you know, how they looked or how the rioters looked. and. It's hard to tell on something like that if he's just doing that to spin and to try to distance himself versus whether he actually thought it. Um, but he has said enough, you know, sort of, can you believe um, Can you believe these people, versions of that, that it, it does give you a window into how he thinks. That he looks down on them. At least, at least in moments, in yeah. In times. Yeah. Obviously, he has a lot of investigations surrounding him right now. Obviously, he's not any stranger to that. And you, you write about that in the book, how, you know, growing up and his early days in New York, he would try to strong arm the SEC or, or kind of bulldoze his way to get what he wanted. And he brought that to the Oval Office and to the presidency, really. And one of the lines about his attorneys now and his attorneys then really stuck out to me, where he was being deposed in, d in the 2000s in a lawsuit against Tim O'Brien when you said that his attorneys realized he simply could not be coached out of saying whatever he wanted to, writing his own script as he went along. I would assume that his attorneys right now who are working on the Mar-a-Lago case, on the January 6th investigations, would say, yeah, I agree with that. 
yes. And then some of them would say yes, <laughs> and others would say this is this is not good. Um, and and that that split and that that schism within his circle of advisors and lawyers or you know uh, political advisors, financial advisors is a hallmark of whatever he has run uh, and happens every single time. But it is true that that lawsuit and the deposition that he gave in that lawsuit was incredibly revealing about, you know, he talked about how he makes mental projections on what his golf courses were worth. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a reminder, and Tim O'Brien won that suit. I just wanna Which said, he said that it depended on his feelings. Depended on his, his, net, his net worth depended on his feelings, goes up, goes down. Um, this is in a deposition. In a deposition. and. And so, I, I and, and his lawyers realized that there was there were challenges around you know getting him to stick within certain lines. Um, where this became a really I think important and telling and, and and precursor moment was when the Mueller investigation is happening in 2017, and when Mueller is first appointed. Remember, this is after James Comey is fired. Trump tells his lawyers he wants to be literally like go across the street and go talk to Comey. And one of the things I explore here is how it wasn't just bulldozing regulators, although there was certainly a lot of that. There was also a lot of trying to charm people who oversaw him or prosecutors or public officials. Uh, one, of the, one of the most surprising pieces uh, of reporting for me, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with New York's legal system, so I apologize for this uh, little little diversion, but Robert Morgenthau was the Manhattan District Attorney forever, and Trump developed this relationship with him, and Morgenthau was the person whose office, you know, other than the federal prosecutors, most closely oversaw Trump's businesses, and Trump made a point of, of turning him into a friend, and Trump said to me, I asked him, would you still be having, would you have these issues that you're facing right now if Morgenthau was still in office? Morgenthau left office and passed away a while ago, and Trump said, no, Bob Morgenthau was a friend of mine, Bob Morgenthau would not have stood for this. And that said a lot to me about everything that we have seen in terms of his actions. You know what that kind of reminds me of is when he called House Speaker Pelosi when he found out she was going to impeach him over the Ukraine stuff. He, he tried to call her to convince her not to impeach him. He tried, to, he tried to call her and then he talked about suing Congress because he thought that the Supreme Court was going to decide this um, because those are, those are the things he understands. You know, he, he volunteered a story to me uh, during one of our interviews about... And how many interviews did you do with three, him? Three, thank you for asking. Um, three interviews last year. Um, he volunteered a story to me about how he had tried to get Mario Cuomo to arrange for, you know, Andrew Cuomo, when Andrew Cuomo was the HUD secretary and Trump needed some help on one of his projects, he basically wanted Mario to make some connection for Trump. And when Cuomo, when Mario wouldn't do it, Mario Cuomo was the former governor of New York and somebody to whom Trump had given lots of contributions over the years, um, Trump got very angry and, and, and you know, tried to get him, uh, tried, tried to get him fired. And it, it's, uh, and he's just telling me this as if this wasn't gonna Not raise some eyebrows. And so, but this is how he sees the world. What were your three interviews with him like? Uh, so they were overall five hours. The, um, the first- uh, And where the, were they conducted? The first two were at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, one was in March and one was in April. Uh, the one in March, he was in pure salesman mode. Uh, you know, he he was sitting with almost every author who wrote a book at that point, including Michael Wolff, who wrote the first um, less than flattering account of the Trump White House. And and it said, uh, you know, it, it was it was consistent with what we were all reporting at the time, but it was the first book length report yeah. about it. And so, you know, he was in he was in salesman mode. He was trying to charm. He was well aware of the fact that. Uh, you know, January 6th had left an enormous stain on his legacy, and, and I don't, I think, this I don't think was something he thought about at all, but it, it left a, a, a big impact on the underpinnings of democracy in this country. That wasn't something he wanted to talk about, but he did, he was, you know, he wanted to talk about the old days in New York, and he, he was bitter about Biden, but not viscerally the way we've seen since. He, he made, it was right after Biden had that incident where he was tripping up the steps to Air Force One. Yeah. And Trump said something to the effect of, do you, th do you really think I lost to the guy who fell up the stairs? And that was actually, I thought him. Less like about Biden, more about him. him. Correct. And so, but it was not, we, it was, he wasn't talking, you know, about fraud or, you know, the election. It, he, he was insisting that he didn't really lose, but it wasn't as vociferously as it became. And then a few weeks later, I went back down for a follow-up. And uh, 
he was in a terrible mood. And he had, I found out later that he had apparently been dragging some of his employees around Mar-a-Lago, showing them messed up plaster and various spots in the wall. That and he wanted to fix before you came? Right, no, no, that's, these were not related. Um, these were, these were, these were. I these, do that too at my house. These were, who, who among us? I, I think mean, I can fix all my problems before anyone yes, shows up. Yes, I was actually gonna do a perimeter walk, so. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, he was in a terrible mood and he, he immediately started out talking about what was front of mind for him at that point, which was that so-called audit of Arizona, which was being done by, um, I think it was conservatives who, you know, were trying to challenge the result of the election. Their so-called audit ended up affirming that Joe Biden won, ultimately. Um, but he, he kept saying he was watching it very closely. I found out later he had tried getting the Republican National Committee to pay for that audit. Uh, and he was in a terrible mood, and he was incredibly critical of Sidney Powell, which was interesting to me. Uh, and it, it it prompted one of the more – there's these moments where he just sort of reads the stage directions out loud. Uh, and so I was um, – I asked him why he had trusted Sidney Powell the way he did, uh, meaning, you know, he was going to make her a special counsel and he was really heeding her advice. And he said something to the effect of, I, I wouldn't have, you know, had I known what she would say recently, which was in response to this um, lawsuit against her, um, a defamation lawsuit, where she basically said in response to an election, I think it was Dominion, mm -hmm. uh, which protested her, her claims about their machines, she basically said, you know, why would anyone take me seriously or believe what I had to say? And he said, that is so demeaning for her to say about herself. And he said, all she had to do was take all these news stories, and he, and he, and he emphasized it and said, he really hoped that I put this in the book. Um, the, uh, all she had to do, and I, and I did, all she had to do was say, uh, you know, upon information and belief, and then point to all these news stories about, you know, election fraud. That's all she had to do. And it was like sitting with the ghost of Roy Cohn. It was like, I mean, he literally, who was his, you know, his mentor and fixer, his first one. Um, that, was a, that was an interesting moment. And then the, the third one was in September of 2021. Okay. And it was the second time, it was at Bedminster. He, he wanted to talk. Uh, Lindsey Graham was at the club, was supposed to have dinner with Trump. He kept sending someone to get Trump to come upstairs for dinner. And Trump wouldn't. He just, and he, and he seemed sort of amused that Lindsey Graham was desperately not trying to get him to right, come down to dinner. Right, not happy about it, right. And so, um, and he just kept talking and talking and talking and talking and and he still wanted to go backwards to 2020. And at one point I asked him, you know, do you, I have some questions to ask you about 2024. And he, he said, 2024? I mean, it was as if, why, why would we do that? So. When you go into an interview like that and, and you have a list of questions and topics you want to hit, and he veers off course so much. I, I remember one time in a coronavirus briefing, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, I asked about ventilators and the question veered off to the Middle East. And I was sitting there like, <laughs> did I ask the wrong, did I black out and ask the wrong question? Like I couldn't remember. And so when you go in there, how do you, how do you make sure you're talking about the things you want to talk about and not just him relitigating 2020 or certain topics that you want to hit? So it's, I would answer that question two ways. One is, I actually, something you asked him once in one of those briefings is something I think about a lot, about one of the best ways to ask him a question, which was he had cited some fact, and I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't true. And you said, that's not true. Who told you that? And it was a great <laughs> question. It was, it was one of the... It was one of the, the if our friend Olivia Nuzzi is in the house, she knows what it was. That was... <laughs> he, said, he said when he was president, when you're president, you have absolute, absolute that's power. That's what it was, authority. yes. That's absolute, absolute power. Um, that was something. Anyway, so, um, uh, but I thought the way you handled that was spectacular, and I thought it was a real model for how you sort of turn something to get him to actually focus. It's hard. I mean, sometimes letting him talk does yield something. So, for instance, the Sidney Powell stream of consciousness yeah. was very interesting. Um, you know, there were a couple of other moments that, that, were, that were like that. But sometimes you have to just interrupt him and say, you know, I want to go back to blah, blah. And sometimes he will jolt back, uh, one of those times, and I, I read about this, he was going, he was talking for a very long time about how the city of New York had tried to cancel his contract to, on a Bronx golf course that he leases and, and that he finished the renovation of. And so we, we literally did like five minutes on this and I'm just listening and I, so I, I tried redirecting it because um, this was going on a bit. And he and he cut me off, and he said something like, "Let me just finish this, and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna tell you." And I said, "Okay." And then he said, "He said, let me just like let me just finish." And I, I said, "Yeah." 
and he sort of hurt himself and he, he looks at his two aides who are in the interview and he says, and he gestures to me and he says, I love being with her, she's like my psychiatrist. <laughs> and it doesn't mean anything. This is a line that is intended to flatter. This is something he has said about a number of things. He says it about interviews. But it was, um, it was indicative of just how much he is working it out in real time in front of everyone. And in that moment, he just needed to talk. Um, so sometimes redirecting him works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes he's whipped up in such a terrible mood that, you know, and you know this, you, you can't get an answer. Um, but my approach to this, honestly, for this book project was there were things only he could answer. And I needed to ask these questions. Did you try to interview him any time after the third time? Um, no, because then I reported in February that he'd been flushing documents down the toilet in the White House, and that <laughs> was not seen as a Wasn't fan, fan favorite, so no, <laughs> that was that. But I, there is one question I wish I had asked him. Um, Which is? And, and I, I started thinking about it recently, and, and I don't even know that I would have gotten the truth, but it still would have been interesting whatever he said. Did he ever consider a taping system in the White House? And the reason that I wish I had asked that is, uh, and I don't think he would have said yes, uh, and, I, and I, I've been told by everyone that no such thing existed, um, but A, he has a Nixon vaccination. He kept talking about Nixon in our interviews. Nixon wrote him letters. This was a, a big thing for a while. Um, and he, he, he sort of courted that relationship. Um, and he liked comparing his impeachment to Nixon's near impeachment. That was another one. He told me he was having a great time during his impeachment. Nixon's was a dark time. Um, <laughs> but also, there was al Trump was always notoriously described as taping. When he was, you know, uh, at Mar-a-Lago, there were I, in his campaign offices in 2016, aides thought they were being bugged. So I just, I wish I had asked that question. I'm sure you'll have the chance again, potentially someday. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I do want to talk about Twitter because this has been such in the headlines, and I'll get to my question on that. But one of the best parts of the book was you talked about when Trump first got his Twitter account. And people were trying to encourage him to use it. It was this new thing. They were saying that you could get more engagement if you interacted with people. And then he realized he could just tweet on his own. It didn't have to be a, an aide saying, actually, this is a good right. idea for you to tweet about. And Justin McConney compared when Trump realized that he could tweet himself without any engineering or planning behind it, that it was like in Jurassic Park when the dinosaurs learned they can open the doors themselves. <laughs> um. <laughs> Trump's Twitter feed went from being sort of a source of amusement to people who worked for him to a source of sort of <laughs> daily horror. Um, and, uh, and that obviously continued in the White House. Um, one of the, uh, the things that I found in my reporting was that he, he spent an incredible amount of time trying to figure out what engaged people on Twitter. So, you know, uh, this woman, Meredith MacGyver, who worked for him and became famous because she was the one who supposedly plagiarized from Michelle Obama's speech at the convention <laughs> that Melania Trump delivered. Um, but she- That seems like so long it ago. It seems like a very <laughs> long time ago. She sent um, an email to Sam Nunberg, who was an aide who was working for uh, Trump at the time, who worked on his Twitter feed a lot and suggested a lot of tweets. Um, and she said, you know, he's been looking at this and he's been realizing that, you know, the stuff about New York doesn't really get attention. You know, the global things get more attention. And he noticed this has more retweets and like, and it was, it was wild uh, just how much time was being spent on this. Um, and for him, it, it was ultimately a perfect medium, right? I mean, he could just stir up a controversy and he could scream at someone and walk away. And, and more importantly, everything looks flat and the same on Twitter. And he is a man who is honestly devoid of context. You know, I mean, one of the things that I thought about a lot after my interviews with him, I asked him about um, Mead Esposito, who was the deeply corrupt former Brooklyn Democratic Party chair, machine boss politician, who Trump's father was close with, um, and Trump had ties to. And Trump described, um, Trump was incredible, like talked about him as if he was talking about, you know, a hero. And he said, Meade ruled with an iron fist. It's the same language he uses about Xi Jinping. It's just that, you know, the, the, Id the idea of strength stays the same. It just sort of doesn't matter where he is at any given moment. He's impressed by it. He's well, he's impressed by it, and it doesn't occur to him that not every setting is just like every other setting, which is why Twitter was so good for him. Do you think he would get back on Twitter if Elon Musk allows him to get back on Twitter? There is zero doubt in my mind that he would come back to Twitter, even though I know he has said he, he hasn't. He has said yeah. he would not get back on Twitter. People want me to. I must. It will be something like that. This is a really interesting question. Um, has anyone who is anti-Trump, a reader, reacted to parts of your book 
thinking differently or maybe admiring Trump a little bit? Boy, if they have, I haven't heard from them. <laughs> they haven't written you? <laughs> you know, I want to talk about you also because you have said in a few interviews that you've done about this book, which is exceptional and everyone should read it, that you don't think he is obsessed or fixated on you particularly. You think it's the New York Times. I don't think that's true. I why, do think that's Why true. do you think that? Because I think that he's a credentialist. I mean, think about how much time he spent obsessing about aides who went to Harvard, um, you know, or, or how much he talks about the Wharton School of Finance. I think that the New York Times looms exceptionally large for him in his psyche. Um, I would urge all of you, I don't know if you're daily listener, the daily, the New York Times podcast, yay, I love all the we head shaking. The we love the daily, we love Michael Barbaro. Um, there was a an in really, I thought, revealing episode uh, in I think February 2019, which emerged from an interview that my colleague Peter Baker and I did with Trump that our publisher, A.G. Salzberger, uh, was with us for, and it's because Trump had, had been trying to sort of Wu A.G., who is, who is a, a terrific, terrific newspaper man and wouldn't do it unless it was an interview and we were on the record. And at some point in this back and forth, Trump says he's complaining about our coverage, which every president does. But he, he said, I think I'm entitled to a good story from my paper. And if you want to know what Donald Trump really thinks of the New York Times, that's it. And so... He is, he is a boy from the outer boroughs of New York City uh, who sees himself as an outsider and views the New York Times as the pinnacle of attention and the paper that he, he wanted respect from, a and, and that's it. But you were better primed to cover him than probably anyone else at the New York Times because of you knew all of this stuff about hi him growing up in New York and how that shaped him and changed him in a way that caught a lot of other reporters off guard. I, th I just think the fact that I had worked in the tabloids probably helped me um, in, a, <laughs> in a different way. Um, but, uh, and I had covered him pretty intensely in 2011 when he considered running for president more seriously than he let on at the time. So I'm obsessed with this also because you talk about how you were covering him and taking him seriously in 2012, 2011, that he, maybe he was actually running. And you said you were somewhat aggravated when he announced that he wasn't running because you had treated it as a somewhat serious proposition. You felt like you people thought you were gullible for the coverage you gave him, and that you were concerned that you were manipulated into elevating his profile. I was in the same way that you know I, I look back at a lot of coverage, and you know we were doing our jobs, but um, you know this is a person who. Uh, let me answer it a different way. Uh, part of why he got so much coverage in 2011 was that he was spreading this lie about President Obama being born in Ken maybe born in Kenya, which was a lie that he had been nurturing privately for a while, you know, I write about how, uh, you know, he, he gave his speech at, at CPAC in February of 2011, and Matt Strawn, then the Iowa GOP chairman, is watching the reaction to this speech and decides we've got to have that guy at our, at our June fundraising dinner, um, or some Which one is the, the dinner where presidential hopefuls go to. Correct, and he can be the keynote, and Trump agrees, this is great. When Strawn and an aide go to Trump Tower to meet with him to talk about this, Trump is talking about Obama and he waves something from his desk and says, I'm not even sure he's born here. And that was way before this was public. So uh, he was, he was and as he often does, and you know this, he kicks these things around for a while and, and sees how they play with people. Um, so that was part of why he was getting attention and we were rightly um, saying that this wasn't true. What we were also doing, and that was obviously not our goal, but it was spreading the lie further. And so that's something that we have to contend with as a a flip side of our business. I was also seeing that he was getting a real reaction among certain aspects of the party's base and that he was clearly, there, there was an element of the base, particularly in that, that year or two right after uh, the Tea Party uh, emergence, um, that wanted to see a candidate who would fight Obama. And in a way that you know Romney with his patrician roots just was never going to. And so there was a reason to cover him. But yes, I was getting lots of, he is never going to run, he's not going to release his taxes, which he never did, um, but you know, he did do a personal financial disclosure. And so when, he, when we spent all this time on it, it, it just felt you know, sort of predictable. And then when he was actually going to run, but no one realized he was actually going to run, you were hesitant. They actually wanted you to break that he was running. 
And you said, N- I'm not doing it until he announces that he's actually running. Because at a certain po- point, you feel like you're walking out of foot on a football field with a banana peel, right? I mean, it's like, it, it was, in 2014, uh, it was very clear that there was going to be a very large Republican field yeah. uh, for 2016. It, at one point, it even looked like Mitt Romney might be in it. And my then colleague at Politico, Jake Sherman and I, I, I left Politico at the uh, beginning of 2015 to go to the Times. Uh, we were writing a story about the big field. And Jake said, should we put Trump in? And I said, absolutely not. He is not running. I am not doing this again. And so it was not a good call in retrospect, but it was a very defendable one. And so Sam Nunberg called me, uh, this same Trump aide, and said, Trump's going to announce on on June 16th, and we want you to break it. And I said, no, (laughs) I'm not doing this. And he said, well, will you please come have lunch with him? So I came and I had lunch with him. And got the, you know, the tour of his office on the 26th floor, and he's showing off his trophies. Here's, I mean, not literal trophies. It's like, here's Shaquille O'Neal's shoe. <laughs> and here's a thing. That, I mean, this is, this is real. He has a bu- these, all these tchotchkes in the window. Um, and then we walk out of the office, and he says to, there's a, an, a, a, a there, at least then, there were a bunch of assistants who sat outside who he would refer to as the girls. And he tells, he tells one of them to, to call up the, one of the rap videos. And his name is in the video. And he says, you know, quote, unquote, the blacks, you know, they love me. And then we go downstairs to um, the Trump Grill. And it's me, Hope Hicks, Corey Lewandowski, Sam Nunberg, Michael Cohen, and Donald Trump. A real who's who. Um, it, was a, it, was <laughs> it was an origin story. Um, no, but um, <laughs> Trump is here, and Corey is here. And they're, they're talking back and forth about how much money he's going to spend. And it, it, the numbers were just sort of rising in such a silly way that it was not like it, they were talking about a real budget. And Trump was clearly getting frustrated that I wasn't taking this seriously. Yeah. And, um, but I wasn't taking it seriously. And when he finally ran, you wrote on page 200 that you asked a longtime acquaintance, you know, why now, after all of these considerations before, pretend attempts, banana peels, and the person responded without hesitation, quote, he's gotten crazier. <laughs> yes, that is what the person said. How has your relationship to and with Trump how does that come through in your reporting? Because you have a relationship with him like very few other people do. So I actually, I disagree with you there. I think he's a subject who I cover. Uh, I covered Hillary Clinton. I covered Mike Bloomberg. I covered Rudy Giuliani um, in his final term in, o- in office at City Hall and then his presidential campaign and then versions of him in the last several years. Uh, I covered at more of a remove presidents Clinton, Obama, uh, W. Um, now he just, interprets coverage differently. I don't, I, I just, the word relationship, I think, is not the well right Well, relationship, one. too, I think, I think he thinks of you in a certain singular way that separates you from other reporters. I just don't think that's true. I don't. I, I, I don't. I mean, I think he's obsessed with the Times, and I think that's, that's a lot of it. I think some Times reporters would disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> the Times reporters who wish they had a book. Um, <laughs> This is Lots of times reporters with a book. We're doing okay. <laughs> this is a question not from the audience, but from someone who worked in the Trump White House who I was speaking to, and I said, you know, if you could ask Maggie a question, what would you ask? And they said, what is a common misconception about Trump that has informed, that you understand, that has informed your approach to covering him? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, one is that he's more strategic than he is. Um, you know, there's this desire to overlay strategy on everything he does. I, got, I literally got asked the question every single day in a meeting during the presidency, why is he doing this? And and the one that has come up more recently, the version is, why did he take these documents, right? And so we're gonna, and we're, we clearly don't know the answer to that, but I have some theories, as do you. Um, so that's one. There was a great line in a BuzzFeed story uh, during the presidency, I think it was by Tarini Party, where she quoted an anonymous Trump aide saying that, uh, some, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was everyone thinks that he's playing 3D chess, but more often not, than not, he's just eating the pieces. And so... Um, a great quote. It was a great quote, and it was a real quote. And so... Um, and it's all, it's all due to sort of the myth-making, right? I mean, part of what he's been doing for 40 years is building this version of himself as this genius, you know, both as a business genius, which he was not, um, and both as a mega tycoon, which he was not. The, the thing is, there's enough real there to point to a physical building that's a giant building on Fifth Avenue. People look at that, especially outside of New York City, and they're like, I don't know, that's a big building. Looks like he did something. So uh, it becomes hard to explain to people that, you know, he's not as rich as other people. He's still richer than most people. So that's, that's one thing. Um, he is more calculating than people realize, and that is different than strategic. Um, he is not able to do a long-term anything 
but he is, oh, he's really not. I mean, I don't, I don't, um, it doesn't mean that he won't find a way, but, um, but he doesn't plan. Um, but he, but what he can do is hunker down and refuse to move off of something, and then that looks like a strategy. Um, but he is often playing some kind of game with people and with events that's apparent only to him. Um, one of the things that Bill Barr told people when, when he left the White House, and I heard this from a bunch of folks, was that Trump was more calculating than he had realized at first. Um, and, and it takes a bit to understand sort of the, the games he's playing. Speaking of the documents, someone wants to know, why do you think Trump is holding on to some of these documents still? Why? Um, no, it's, I mean, I, I... The Justice Department wants to know The Justice question, Department is on. <laughs> Um, Maybe they're here. <laughs> so, th <laughs> we reported last night. I think that you guys did too. That um, you guys, being CNN, did too. That uh, the, the Justice Department told his lawyers a couple weeks ago that they think he still has more documents. And so, uh, uh, one of the and you asked him about this. Well, n no. During your interviews, what, what, yeah. Generally. Let me let me say what I actually asked him about because this has gotten a little a little mischaracterized. And by a little, I mean a lot mischaracterized. Mm. I um, I asked him on a lark did you take any memento documents? I asked him this in September 2021. And I asked him because he had been, you know, waving these Kim Jong-un letters around at people in the Oval Office for a really long time, you know, visiting dignitaries, reporters. I mean, these were sensitive things. Um, you know, were they nuclear secrets? No. Um, but they were, um, you know, they were not for public consumption. And so I asked him and he said, nothing of great urgency, no. So his immediate impulse was to say no. And then he starts talking about the Kim Jong-un letters. And he, s he seemed to be saying maybe, it was completely mushy. Maybe he, I couldn't understand what he was saying. But I said, oh, you were able to take those with you? And he kept talking, which I thought was some kind of affirmation. And I said, wow, or huh, or something. And he, registering my surprise, said, no, no, I think those are in the archives. Uh, you know, but we have great things, it's just, which I don't know what to do with that, <laughs> especially with somebody who often doesn't tell the truth. Um, so, uh, you know, he hadn't given the letters back to the archives at that point. Um, the letters had been the subject, we learned much later, of communications between his officials and um, the archivists. Um, but it's much more interesting to me as a comment now, in hindsight, after what we know since August 8th, which was the FBI raid of mar -a And that his first instinct was to say, say no. Say no, correct. I know we only have five minutes left. I have two more questions for you. Kay. Some of the best and most revealing parts, I feel like when it comes to movies, are the bloopers at the end yes. and being able to see what it was yeah. really like for them to film them. Is there anything that you didn't include in this book that you wished you had or that didn't really fit or, or that didn't match the serious tone of it? The answer is an emphatic yes. Um, I will tell you two stories. Um, okay. In most cases, it was stuff that I couldn't either couldn't confirm enough that I felt comfortable. Um, in some cases, it just didn't sort of move. I mean, it, you think when you're going to get a book, I don't know how I'm going to fill it. And then you're like, oh my God, <laughs> I have to cut this and this and this. It's already a really long book. Um, so uh, I, at a certain point, you can't keep having the sa a same version of an anecdote over and over again. I heard um, two stories after, uh, after I had finished the book that I would have included if, if I could have. And one is H.W. <coughs> Bush, out, newly out of office, maybe a year or two, is at JFK Airport. He's getting ready to go do a speech overseas, and he's reading a newspaper, possibly a newspaper I work for. And, um, and someone comes over to him and says, excuse me, Mr. President, Donald Trump is here, and he's wondering if you'd like to meet him. <laughs> and, and Bush sort of pulls, the, over. pulls the paper <laughs> down and says no, and then goes back to... And thus began a decades-long warmth toward the bushes. So that's um, why he hates the that's bushes. That's why he hates the bushes. <laughs> um, so that's that's one. The other is, um, and I, I have some I have some reporting in the book. I, something that hasn't come up a lot in interviews about this book that uh, is a theme throughout. And I really did try to write a book of reporting and not takes. But um, the theme and of you succeeded in that. Oh, thank you. But the the theme of um, of how violence animates his idea of strength. And then strength in, terms in turn animates what makes a good boss. So there's a couple of incidents. One is 1990, one is 2019, where he throws things. Um, in one case, he throws it at a person who's quitting the Trump organization. The guy's quitting and he literally throws something at him. And the friend of the guy thought it was a shoe. Um, 
in 2019 when he finds out that James Comey is not getting charged and, and Barr is telling him no. He, he spends the afternoon calling one person after another in the little dining room off the Oval Office. You know, don't you think he should have been charged? Um, and then in frustration, he picks up the remote control of the television in there and slams it into the credenza in front of people. Um, this is, I think, important in the con, what's I think it's interesting, but I think it's important in the context of the January 6th hearing where Cassidy Hutchinson testified and talked about, which I'm sure many of you watched, if not all, and she talked about an episode where he threw a cheeseburger at, a, at the wall um, and people were cleaning the ketchup up and that she was part of it. I, I did hear the, from others that the cheeseburger incident did happen. Um, I, I just think it's very revealing about his reactions to stress, anger, and so forth. Um, and I, I sort of think that's an overlooked part of, of him. And it's a, re a really revealing part, also, if you talk to people who, who worked in the West Wing, who saw this up close. Yeah. Okay, actually, two more questions. Sorry, quickly, one <laughs> into that. What was it like, I mean, you're one of the best sourced Trump reporters that anyone knows. Were people more willing to talk to you because it was a book and it wasn't going to be in the Times on the A1 the next day? 100%. I mean, so I, one of the things that I found out in, in the process of covering Trump a couple of years ago as all of these these books by competitors were popping up and they had such good stuff in them um, you know the the, uh, the the first Phil Rucker book had just amazing stuff um, and I asked somebody who had clearly talked for the book who I had asked a question related to something in the book for the paper and I was annoyed why do people do this why will you not tell me this when I ask you but why are you doing this for a book and their answer was because there's no immediacy. It doesn't come out right away. It's I don't have to worry about it. It's not a tomorrow problem. And implicit in that was there's not going to be a big leak hunt right, you know, right away to figure out what this is. I don't have to worry about this being shoved in Trump's face. And it was interesting. I got a text from um, a, a Democratic operative who I've known for a long time this morning who saw that I had said that in another interview. And the person said this really spoke to me because that's why I do it. And you know, I just don't have to worry the same way. So this, there, was, there was some bipartisanship um, in this. Um, <laughs> But there were people who just refused, including when I would say, can I please use this in the paper for tomorrow? They wouldn't do it. So I was working with my editors at the Times a lot throughout this book and stuff that you know was confirmable that we could put in the report that the editors wanted, we did. And I think that really speaks to when people say, oh, you sat on this interesting story or something Trump said for a book. I it was you have to get people to actually say stuff to you and, and sometimes it's under their conditions. Well, and also I think there's an assumption that A, if something appeared, we must have known it in real time and that's mm -hmm. just a complete mistake, uh, number one. Um, and, and number two, there is to, I it isn't just about sort of where it appears. We, we don't actually as reporters just print everything we hear the second we hear it because we need to confirm it and so we need to make sure it's real. Um, and and that's a part of our process too. My last question is going to come from an audience member. Do you think that Donald Trump actually wants to be president again? At this point, yes. I actually think I think the reverse is true of what was true in 2016. I think that he didn't want to be president. He just wanted to see if he could win. And he was having fun campaigning. And now I think he doesn't want to campaign and he just wants to be president. <laughs> Can we get a big round of applause for Maggie Haberman? Thank you so much. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, thank you, thank you.